The first class of annelids that we'll look at are the polychaetes, which are the largest class by a pretty good margin with uh, over 10,000 species. They're found in both fresh and salt water, but the majority of them are marine, uh, where they are extremely common and are very diverse. Uh, one of the characteristics that uh, distinguishes the polychaetes are that they all have parapodia. Parapodia are the extensions from each segment uh, divided into two lobes, an upper lobe and a lower lobe, and uh, typically armed with a number of CT, considerably more CT than are seen in the other classes. Parapodia play a lot of roles in the polychaetes. Uh, most obvious one is that they function in locomotion, either in swimming or in crawling around on the surface. They also, in uh, a number of groups, play a role in moving water, particularly in some of the sedentary polychaetes. Uh, they also play a role in respiration because they provide uh, increased surface area that can be vascularized and function in gas exchange. The polychaetes are primarily dioecious, um, and many of them have transitory gonads, uh, as the uh, palola worm that we talked about to start out the, uh, the section on the annelids. Polychaetes are a very large group with more than 40 families. We will look at two non-phylogenetic, non-taxonomic groups, uh, groups that are formed on the basis of habitat and lifestyle called the errant polychaetes and the sedentary polychaetes. These two groups are adapted for very different lifestyles with the errant polychaetes being an active group, uh, well-developed parapodia. The sedentary polychaetes are designed for a life in the, in the sediment and in many cases the parapodia are reduced. The errant polychaetes are adapted for an active lifestyle. Many of them are uh, active swimmers or crawlers. Many of them are predatory. And as a result, they take on a body form that's adapted for movement. This is the worm you looked at in the lab last week that uh, we used as a representative polychaete. You may also see it referred to as Nereus, which is the old name. The, uh, you also saw a cross-section of this. Notice the parapodia on the body. These worms are predators. They have an eversible pharynx equipped with a jaw, which uh, they can extend when they're feeding on other small invertebrates that they encounter on the surface of the sediment. Here's another look at the jaw. Uh, the upper image is the head with the jaw retracted and the lower image shows the pharynx everted with the uh, the well-armed jaw. Here are some sedentary polychaetes. Notice the dramatically different body form. These are adapted for uh, typically a life in the sediment, in the substrate. Uh, some of them are tube builders. Some of them uh, simply burrow. Here are some examples. This is a sabellid polychaete, which has uh, highly developed tentacles that they use to filter feed from their tube. This is one of the more dramatic ones. This is Ketopterus. The image on the top is the worm itself. Uh, look at the way in which the parapodia have been highly modified. Ketopterus builds a tube out of a parchment-like material. Lives inside the tube. Tubes open at both ends and water flows through the tube. The flow of water is created by the action of the parapodia and Ketopterus filters food material out of the water as it flows through the tube. Here's another of the sedentary polychaetes. This is Aranicola, uh, particularly common along our coastline. Aranicola is a burrower. It uh, creates a J-shaped tube and forces water through the tube and into the sand at the end of the tube. It's, the tube's not open at both ends, but uh, you can see in the diagram how the uh, flow of water creates a very distinctive burrow. And then Aranicola simply ingests the sediment 
uh, that has collected the filtered material. It uh, produces very distinctive looking burrow. You've probably seen these if you've spent any time along the, uh, particularly the softer sediments along the coast on some of the bays and estuaries. We'll move now to the second class of annelids. That's the class Clitellata. Uh, as you may recall, I told you that this class contains two subclasses that at one time were standalone classes. The first one that we will look at is the subclass Oligochaeta. As you might expect, uh, the name is a reference, again, to the number of bristles, where Polychaeta refers to the many bristles that are found on each segment. In the case with the Oligochaeta, it's a reference to the fact that there are considerably fewer bristles. Where the polychaetes are primarily a marine group, the oligochaetes are more common in either freshwater or terrestrial habitats. Uh, of course, this includes the common earthworm that you dissected last week. It's a considerably smaller group than the polychaetes. Characteristic uh, here is the absence of parapodia. The head is typically not as highly developed as, as we saw in the polychaetes, especially in the errant polychaetes. In the oligochaetes, the head's typically either absent or it's just a rounded cone like the prostomium you saw in dissection. They have CT, although uh, they are fairly indistinct in the terrestrial forms. They're longer in the aquatic forms. Key characteristic is the clitellum which, as we've discussed, is that uh, glandular area that plays a role in reproduction. Most of the members of this group are hermaphroditic, as we, again, saw in the dissection. We'll uh, take a look at an illustration of that in a second. Most of the oligochaetes are adapted for feeding on uh, dead organic matter, and they have a gut that's modified to do so. Here's our old friend, the earthworm, which uh, you know fairly intimately by now. Take note of the prostomium, which overhangs the mouth, the uh, very characteristic clitellum, and although you can't really see it in this diagram, the CT. Remember that in the earthworms, there are two pairs of CT on each side of the body, uh, one pair up high and one pair down low. And of course, the digestive tract is complete with a mouth on one end and an anus on the other end. The members of this group uh, all have some ability to reproduce asexually, uh, often by fragmentation. They all also reproduce sexually, and when they do, they are hermaphroditic. Uh, they have permanent gonads, and usually the reproductive system is found in the anterior segments. Again, as you saw in the dissection, you can take a look at this diagram and see the way in which sperm is passed from one worm, from the male reproductive structures of one worm to the female reproductive structures of the, uh, of the other worm. 